All right, everyone, the topic of today's video is going to be on shielding gases that we use in gas metal arc welding. So if we think back to shielded metal arc welding, there was a flux coating that as it burned off, it formed a shielding gas. Now in GMAW, we don't have a flux coating on our electrodes, so we need to supply a shielding gas from another source. And those sources are compressed gas cylinders. And there are various types of shielding gases. They are both inert and reactive. Now, if they're inert, what that means is that they do not chemically react with the weld. So as they're protecting the weld and flowing out of the nozzle, they're not doing anything to the weld, so to speak. Now, the shielding gases that are reactive, those do chemically react with the weld. And we'll talk a little about a little bit more about those in some later slides. The main focus or the main purpose of the shielding gas is to protect the weld as we're welding as it cools off. So the shielding gas just makes sure that impurities that are in the air around us don't get into the weld which will lead to um, discontinuities or basically weld flaws down the road. Now there's a few different factors that come into play when we choose which shielding gases uh, we're going to be using. The two main factors that we're going to be talking about in this presentation are what mode of transfer we're using. And if you're unfamiliar with that term, don't worry, I'm going to cover that in another video. And then the other factor that comes into play is what type of metal are we welding on? So those two are the major players when it comes to determining what shielding gas or what mixture of shielding gas we're going to be using. All right, so there are a couple different ways that we can supply shielding gas to the welding machine to eventually exit the nozzle and protect the weld. One of them is using a manifold system, and the other one is where we basically hook the machine up directly to the gas cylinder. So let's take a look at the manifold system first. So you might, it might be a little tricky to see, but we have four manifold systems in this image. So there's a red one, a green one, a blue one, and a yellow one. And then you can see these lines that kind of extend off of them, and it looks like they're going into the shop, right? And that's basically what a manifold system is. We'll have one or more compressed gas cylinders that are hooked up to each manifold system. And then that system runs throughout the welding shop to different locations, to different welding booths. So multiple welding machines can hook into the same line or essentially the same manifold system and use the same gas. Now, if we're hooking the machine up directly to the cylinder, it's a shorter route for the gas to travel. And what you're going to be hooking into directly is a regulator and flow meter. Now, you're still going to have a regular and flow meter with a manifold system. There's just going to be multiple of these throughout the shop. And so here, if we take a look at a, a diagram, this might look familiar. I've used it in a previous video. So we have the neck of the welding gun, the nozzle, and we can see the wire electrode extending out of the nozzle we have the welding arc, we have the welding puddle and the droplets of filler metal. And then we have the shielding gas. So you can see the shielding gas basically surrounds and covers the weld and it keeps all impurities out. That's, that's pretty much the job of the shielding gas. Now let's start talking about the types of shielding gases. Remember, there's two kinds. There's inert and reactive. Inert gases do not chemically react with the weld, whereas reactive gases do. And the four main shielding gases that we'll use in GMAW are argon, CO2, or carbon dioxide, helium, and oxygen. So let's start with argon first. Argon is one of the most commonly used shielding gases, and it does a lot of different things. But let's start with the basics. One. It's denser than air, or in other terms, it's heavier than air. So it does a really good job pushing air out of the way as it comes out of the nozzle and protects the weld. Now, 
there's argon in the very air that we breathe. So when manufacturers are producing pure oxygen, argon is a byproduct. So oftentimes manufacturers will bottle or, or capture the argon as they're separating it from oxygen. And with that being said, argon is very inexpensive to produce compared to the other shielding gases that are used in welding. And there's a, a couple other things. So argon will influence the size of the weld and it also influences the behavior of the welding arc. So it has this thing called low heat conductivity. So as the arc establishes and we're welding, the argon that's exiting the nozzle doesn't do, or it, it doesn't get electrically charged as much as other gases. So what this does is it prevents the arc from widening, from getting bigger, becoming erratic. So it keeps the arc kind of small, focused to one central area, you know, pretty much where we want to be welding. And so the end result is a narrower weld, not to say that it's too narrow, but it's not as wide as it could be with other shielding gases. And this is actually something that's desirable. We don't want a weld that's so big that leads to, you know, risk of, of more cracking or more, more flaws down the road. So just keep that in mind. Argon is inexpensive. It helps to stabilize the welding arc and it helps to keep a tight weld. And then one last thing, argon is a shielding gas that we can, that can be used to weld any metal. So you can use it to weld carbon steel, stainless steel, aluminum, titanium, pretty much anything that's out there, you can use argon to weld it, whether that's 100% argon or a mixture of argon and something else. Now let's talk about carbon dioxide, or for short, CO2. Now, as we breathe in air, we exhale CO2. So CO2 is also a very inexpensive shielding gas when compared to the other gases that are produced. CO2 can also be used uh, all by itself in 100% CO2 uh, cylinders, or it can be used in mixtures. It depends on what we're trying to do. So let's go back to modes of transfer. And if you, if you don't know that, like I said, I'll cover this in another video, but this is something that I have to include so that way it all makes it down the road. So when we're using short circuit or globular transfer, CO2 is completely acceptable to use. Now CO2 is one of the gases that chemically reacts with the weld. And so a couple different things that CO2 does, or at least allows for, it allows for a hotter arc, it allows for a much wider weld, and it also allows for more penetration. However, the downsides to using CO2 is that your arc is less stable, and also it allows for a lot of spatter. So CO2 being used all by itself is okay for smaller shops to use, like, you know, especially in the case of your if you're just learning how to MIG weld, it's completely fine to use 100%. But something that we're gonna talk about later on is that it's actually frowned upon to use globular transfer. This is not a, a mode of transfer that is you know, preferred out in industry. We sort of skip over it and move to the next mode of transfer. So just to recap, CO2, fairly inexpensive. It can be used by itself or a mixture with other shielding gases. While it does allow for a hotter arc and more penetration, the welding arc is a little erratic and it allows for a lot more spatter, which is something that we want to try to avoid. And one last thing about CO2, while it can be used in high concentrations like 100%, that only applies to carbon steel. So we use varying amounts of CO2 depending on the type of metal we're welding on. So carbon dioxide by itself, keep it to carbon steel. That's it. 
if you're using a mixture of CO2 and something else, say CO2 and argon, that's completely acceptable for carbon steel. Trace amounts, like very small amounts of CO2 can, can be used to weld things like stainless steel or low alloy steel, but that's really it. That's where it stops. CO2 is not used for welding metals like aluminum, titanium, copper, or basically anything that's considered non-ferrous. So anything non-ferrous cannot be welded with CO2. And then we have oxygen. So oxygen is a shielding gas, despite it being a reactive gas, and despite the fact that oxygen can lead to oxidation of the weld, which can result in uh, discontinuities or basically weld flaws. And that's why it's only used in very small amounts. It's always used in gas mixtures. Uh, normally it's not used in uh, short circuit transfer. Normally it's used only in spray transfer. So a couple types of metal that you would find oxygen being used as a shielding gas is with low alloy steel and in stainless steel. But again, very small amounts. You would be using a lot more of the other gases, say like argon. So the percentage of oxygen you would be using is, is you know, like I said, like one, 1%, one you know, 2%, 3%, anywhere around that. And then that brings us to helium. So helium is also used as a shielding gas. This is an inert shielding gas. Helium is also very expensive to produce compared to the other shielding gases. Uh, so fun fact, I don't know if you know this, but there's only a limited amount of helium on planet Earth. And it's not the easiest uh, gas to, to produce, to basically separate or, or mine. This is uh, a rigorous process and it's a finite source. So helium is a little expensive. Uh, to use. So helium is lighter than air. So what does that mean? When we're using helium as a shielding gas, we have to increase the flow rate. We have to use a lot of it in order to protect the weld because it's lighter than air. So we need more of it to basically shove air out of the way in order to protect the weld. Another thing, helium is almost never used by itself as a shielding gas. It's almost always used in a mixture of other gases. So say argon and helium, or argon, helium, and a tiny bit of CO2. It depends on what you're welding. This is not something that you'll be using on carbon steel, and it's not really something you'll be using on stainless steel. Helium comes into play more on non-ferrous metals. So stuff like aluminum, uh, stuff like magnesium, that sort of stuff. So just to kind of cap helium, it's used in small amounts as far as the mixtures. It's more expensive to produce. It's always used in a gas mixture. Oh, one thing I actually forgot was it allows for deeper penetration, but again, this is on non-ferrous metals. So you won't be using this on things like steel or even stainless steel. So let's dig in a little bit more with gas mixtures. These are just some common mixtures. There are more out there, but I just want to touch on these a little bit. And we won't even get that far because these are mixtures that we're not really going to be using in an introductory course, but it's always good for you to know. So there are mixtures of argon and CO2. There are mixtures of argon and helium. There are mixtures of argon, helium, and CO2. And there are mixtures of argon and oxygen. Let's take a quick look at argon and CO2. So if we look down here at the picture, the very last cross section of weld, this is with just 100% CO2 as your shielding gas. So one thing that you'll notice is that compared to the other two welds, it has slightly deeper penetration. Now, as we start adding a mixture of argon, you'll see that the penetration starts decreasing slightly, but our well becomes more uniform in size. And then again, when we bump up the argon, 
our, our weld becomes more uniform in size, slightly less uh, penetration. But we still have really good penetrating power because there is a presence of CO2. When we add argon, all it's doing is stabilizing the arc, and it's also creating for a more controllable weld puddle. So other things that it helps out with is um, reducing spatter. Also, another thing that we should know is that in order to enter spray mode, spray transfer with GMAW, there almost always has to be a presence of argon. In order to achieve spray mode or enter spray mode, there has to be a high presence of argon. The characteristics of argon allow for entering spray mode. Remember, it has low heat conductivity. So it has this effect on the welding arc that allows us to enter spray mode, which is where we're using a lot more voltage and a lot more amperage. And then here's just another image. So this is coming straight from the American Welding Society. So this is just showing some of the differences in weld shape and profile depending on the shielding gas. So let's start at the very right. So if we are only using carbon dioxide, you can see that we have a lot of penetration, but there's going to be a lot of spatter. And so using carbon dioxide is something that we only use with a short circuit. And then we go over to helium. So helium is something that we would use on non-ferrous metals. All right, and so you can see this kind of looks like globular, maybe spray, but I think it's globular. And then we start adding argon to helium. Now we lose a little bit of the penetration, but this is supposed to resemble spray mode, which is much more efficient than globular or short circuit. And then if we were to only use argon, depending on the metal, you see that we have this dip in penetration, but not a whole lot of penetration on the sides and still spray mode. So. A high presence of argon allows us to enter spray mode. Remember that. And then here is just a, uh, a little thorough chart from American Welding Society. So this is kind of giving us some options. It's letting us know whether we're welding carbon steel, stainless steel, low alloy, or anything that's on ferrous. These are the combinations of shielding gases we can use and why we can use them, or basically what they do. And then we have the same thing, but this is when we're using spray transfer. So on the left, what type of metal we're welding on? Aluminum, carbon steel, titanium. The shielding gas mixtures that we have to choose from for those metals. And then a reason why we would use those. Now I know that's a whole lot to take into consideration, but let's remember this. CO2, 100%, carbon steel only, short circuit and globular only. CO2 and argon, you can use that on carbon steel. You can also use it in short circuit, globular, depending on the amount of argon, you can go into spray mode. If you're using argon only, that's something more for like non-ferrous metals. If you start adding helium to the mix, that's also for uh, non-ferrous metals. If we start using oxygen in the mix, that's more for stuff like stainless steel and low alloy steel. A lot of this stuff I don't expect you to memorize, but you know, depending on the metal, you're going to be using different types of shielding gases. But they all serve the same purpose, to protect the weld as it cools and as you continue welding.